Hello, everyone who is on the call today. Thank you for joining us today. This is our fifth webinar. Um, I'm, I'm Kara Ward. I'm a senior account executive at CSS, for those who, of you who don't know me. We've got a special webinar topic today. Um, as we all know, 2020 has definitely brought a flood of needed changes. We will be having some tough conversations today about how HR needs to lead the charge for change and prepare to attract and hire the newest addition to our workforce, which is the class of 2020. Um, HR is currently being required to pivot the way they attract and retain talent. So there's three overall questions that we will be discussing today. Um, so the first one is how HR can lead the charge for change and support the class of 2020 who wants a different work environment and be a part of positive change in the future. Um, how can we help HR lead the change and attract and retain the class of 2020? And how we can help them find employment and bring economic stimulus to themselves and their communities? Third, we will talk about how the class of 2020 will be defined in the future and how HR needs to pivot to attract and retain this generation and the generations to follow. We're hoping to have engagement and conversation from you all by using our chat feature. Um, so I'm sure most of you know how to use it. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, but the chat box can be found at the bottom of your screen. And if anyone wants to send me a message privately, um, that's completely fine, whatever, you, whatever you're comfortable with. So with that being said, I would like to introduce Evan Violet, who's the Managing Director of CSS Professional Staffing Group. Evan's been with CSS for almost nine years, and he currently leads a team that has supported the hiring of more than 27,000 employees in temporary contract and direct hire roles nationwide. Evan fully understands how great talent can make a real difference in human resources, call center office, and accounting finance. So with that being said, on to you, Evan. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kara, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to discussing some of the topics that we have on the agenda and the necessary change that 2020 has brought in about um, and truly how those changes impact employment, HR, younger generations, and different races across our country. I'd like to introduce our subject matter experts. So first, please let me introduce you to Michael Robinson. Michael is an award-winning workforce leader, college administrator, and civic advocate. Michael's empowered and launched thousands towards achieving their life goals through his mentorship and guidance at Temple University and through leadership as a senior pastor at Greater Enon Missionary Baptist Church in Philadelphia. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you, Evan, Kara, Sharon, and the entire Contemporary Staffing Solutions team. Thank you. It's our pleasure, Michael. And also, please allow me to introduce Seldrick Blocker. Seldrick is the Executive Director, Head of North America Asset and Wealth Management Campus Recruiting for J.P. Morgan. He has a demonstrated history of working in the financial services and entertainment industries. Seldrick is skilled in developing competitive and innovative campus and university recruitment programs, diversity recruitment, team management, and leadership. Seldrick is also on the board for National Association of Colleges and Employers. Seldrick, thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome, absolutely. So excited about the conversation with you and Michael um, and everyone else. So looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate it, guys. And, you know, before we kick things off in talking about the, uh, the class of 2020 and how we all work together as HR leaders to make a better tomorrow, I'd like to talk about, you know, the longstanding challenges that have been brought to light nationwide by the tragic murder George Floyd. I, as well as many others, are continuing to seek ways that we can help drive real and lasting change and find ways to construct a positive future with true equality and justice for all, both in our professional and personal communities. Mike, one of the things that you mentioned to us in a previous discussion that's really stood out for us and our team is that the fact that the, mur the murder of George Floyd is truly a workplace related issue. Given the fact that the officers were on the time on the job at the time of the, uh, at the time of the tragedy, it really brings about the conversation on what we as HR leaders can do to be a part of the change that we desperately need in our professional and personal communities. So, Michael, I'd like to just kind of hear from you 
and then Seldrick in terms of what advice you may be able to provide us as HR leaders to really be a driving force for some real and lasting change. Absolutely. Um, I think now is the time more than ever before for us to really take a look at and reevaluate how we're addressing implicit and explicit bias in the workplace. Um, also, possibly rethinking how we do upfront assessments of candidates. Um, should we include more in-depth personality tests and, and scenario testing to kind of get a feel for where people are operating in terms of their, their personalities and temperaments and that kind of thing. And not just hold workshops on implicit and explicit bias for window dressing purposes, but to really, you know, dig deep and do a deep level dive into these, you know, subject matter issues because, you know, as we saw, you know, millions saw, you know, that, that horrific video and that was a job related incident, you know, that was a murder that was committed on the job. And so um, we, we really have to start investing and reevaluating how we look at how we do the upfront assessment in our recruiting and how we roll out these different types of workshops that deal with tough subjects like this to discuss. Yeah, I agree, Michael. And, you know, we oftentimes, I think as, as recruiters and HR managers have the conversation, should we, or should we not look into social media for the individuals that we're screening and talking to and interviewing? So to your point with the changing of how we assess you know, that brings about even more conversation around, do we look into some of those different platforms to see, you know, what the, the personal interests and uh, perceptions are of candidates we're speaking to. Seldrick, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts and um, some of your advice that you may be able to offer to HR leaders as well. Yeah, th thanks. And thanks for, um, for asking. I think it's an interesting time that we're in. I think it's a great time that we're in. And I think, um, as HR leaders, I think sometimes we need to make sure that we don't sanitize the work that we do too much. I mean, the, the human aspect of HR is a real thing. And so um, we have to have some tough and personal conversations. I know my experience over the past couple of weeks has been interesting and I've been through a range of different emotions. Um, if you can't tell by visually looking at me, I'm a black man working in corporate, in, in corporate America. And so you know, emotions have ranged from just confusion on why now, why are we having conversations now? I think um, it was 1975 when Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes started, you know, saying the song, wake up everybody. And so it's interesting that we are starting to wake up, you know, so many years later. Um, but I think as HR leaders, we have to make sure that we're providing that platform so that we can have conversations, start paying attention. So waking up, to things like microaggressions. I know in my own personal and professional career, there have definitely been times um, where I have been um, the target of some microaggressions or comments being made around or assumptions being made um, based on the things that people may think. And if it's happening to me, then it's happening to others. And, it, and I think it's also a really interesting time where everything that, um, black and brown people, or I can't say everything, but a lot of things that we have been socialized to um, operate is now being illuminated. And so it's interesting, but as HR leaders, we can make sure that we are creating a psychologically safe space to have conversations, not just for black and brown people, but for everyone. Um, so I think that's really important. And I also think that um, understanding that the the black experience, the brown experience, the human experience, it varies. So there is a lot of variety. There is a lot of, there's a range of a lot of things. And so I think as we continue to help drive that change, just making sure that we are keeping our eyes open, our ears open um, and engaging in those conversations and, and trying to move away from some of the assumptions that we may previously have been making. I appreciate that, Seldrick. And, you know, one of the things that I think you, you both made very clear is just the openness to a safe environment and having those conversations and talking about those microaggressions and maybe what you may be witnessing. 
Uh, I think that the time for assumptions is completely over. And, you know, the fear of the conversation just has to go away. It just has to be something that we encourage and we promote and we continue to foster, like you said, safe environments to do so. So I know that this topic is, you know, something that is top of mind for all of us. And, and I certainly appreciate you both in, in, you know, kind of shedding some light on it and talking through some of the ways that you guys are helping us uh, better understand we, how we can tr drive change. And I want to thank you both in getting to know you guys over the last few weeks. Uh, it's very evident what you guys are doing in both your personal and professional communities to really lead by example. So we appreciate all you guys do. So we're talking a lot about the future and ways to really make and foster a better future for, for everyone. And, you know, right now the class of 2020 has, has had their senior year really changed um, and, and often, you know, we can say maybe stripped from some of their better events, such as graduations, proms. Uh, I was with a friend over the weekend and, you know, he's unable to really take his junior, now going to be senior daughter to campus tours. They're all virtual. So, you know, it just kind of continues to spiral into the ways that we're seeing the class of 2020 um, have to pivot and, and change. So my first question is we kick into gear Mike is the direct as the director of community outreach and hiring for Temple University, you know, we're seeing a lot of rising unemployment numbers. And, you know, as you know, we see the class of 2020 embark in their career journey at the same time that the unemployment numbers are rising. I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on the state of the union and, and what perception some of the graduates are, are you know, battling through at the time, you know, the given time today. Well, one of the biggest things that this class is battling with is adversity. Um, a lot of these young people, um, especially at the college level, they, they didn't have a traditional graduation. Um, they weren't celebrated um, as their previous uh, peer group and, and graduating class was celebrated. Uh, this is historic. Uh, and this isn't just restricted to the United States. We also know that um, because it's a recession period that we're in right now, um, jobs are gonna be harder to find because companies are gonna be real strategic, right? About how they hire and who they hire. Um, when we look at uh, those uh, that were unemployed from last year that graduated, because typically um, it takes on average between six months to a year for a college grad to find a job. So we have spillover from 2019. There were 3.9 million students that graduated um, from either associate degree programs, bachelor degree, master degree, um, doctoral level degrees in 2019. And you have spillover from that class compounded with the class of 2020 that are competing for, you know, a few of the jobs. And I say few, you know, speaking in general, terms compared to the number of, of graduates that are looking, that they're all competing for the same job. So it's pretty tough and competitive. Um, when we look at um, unemployment, for instance, in, in a year snapshot from May 2019 to May 2000 this year, we saw unemployment at 25.2% um, for uh, this graduating uh, class that we call Generation Z. Um, that's a huge stat. That's a huge amount of people that are unemployed. And we really have to find ways of how we're going to, you know, move that, that number into the employment ranks. Otherwise, it's going to be a drain on the economy because we, we've seen the unemployment claims explode. Historic numbers. Historic numbers for unemployed people. Okay. Yeah, and, and here we are with our, our survey of what percentage of those under 25 years old that are currently unemployed. And, you know, it seems that the overwhelming um, group feels that it's 16 and a half. And, and realistically, Michael, you shared with us through the studies that you have read that the number actually is 27%, which is staggering. 27% of individuals under the year 25 years old are um unfortunately unemployed, which can certainly set the, set the challenges very high for our graduates that are entering the workforce. So, Seldrick, my question's for you in regards to 
what programs or internships or resources would you recommend, um, you know, not only for the graduates, but also for employers to be familiar with and get to know and possibly research so that they can have better context and understanding around what these graduates are doing to better position themselves entering the workforce? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question, and I think you know, for the class of 2020, you know, many of them are um, scheduled to start their full-time programs or are looking for work. And I think for some of the large companies, there are a lot of avenues that people go into. So becoming an analyst class or a trainee class for the year 2020. I know some companies may have scaled back on their hiring or may have canceled their programs, uh, which is unfortunate. But I also think what companies are going to have to do is think outside of the box on how do we engage with the class of 2020. Um, so traditionally, a lot of companies say you must graduate in 2020 to start the program in 2020. Um, but do we look at that differently now um, and extend that window uh, for future classes um, or for the class of 2020 rather? But I think we also, and kind of how the campus recruiting cycle works, a lot of times we're recruiting a year in advance. So we're starting to have conversations currently about the summer intern class of um, so com compiled upon that is we have new technology in place we're doing a lot of things virtually it's new for us as HR leaders we have to find ways to socialize um, incoming hires but also engage potential recruits uh, make sure they feel that they are being included and there's that level of um, camaraderie, so on and so forth. And, and, and within the internship space, I mean, there are a number of organizations um, like Inroads, MLT, SEO, Posse, just to name a few that have been leaders within uh, helping students gain access to internships. I know I am a product of Inroads. Um, so I did an internship through my college career, went to my company um, at the time, uh, or went back to the company I had done my internships with. Uh, once I graduated school. And so the, these types of organizations are great ways of uh, developing diverse talent, connecting with corporations, small businesses, mid-sized, large companies to infuse that talent into the, or, into the organization. But you know, the, game, the, 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 the rules of the game are different. So we're having to, everyone is having to figure out how to operate in this, this new space. And you know, a lot of times there are things that I wish I knew yesterday that would help me today. Um, and so we're all figuring it out as we go. Absolutely, absolutely. Evan, go may, ahead, I, may, may I Please. add a little bit? Um, also, when it comes to how do we embrace this, this class and even looking forward, I think we need to start cultivating relationships, especially as we look forward with student organizations that are on campus. I know oftentimes the epicenter for recruiting is starting with the Career Center that most campuses have, but I think we also need to take it from the traditional um, career centers and alumni uh, offices to actually building a stronger and more robust relationship with student leadership groups on campus um, because you're going straight to the source and you are, you're empowering the student groups and you're creating greater alliances that way with the students who are going to be your emerging leadership uh, down the road. Um, uh, Seldrick mentioned Inroads as a one of the prominent internship uh, feeding groups. Uh, Year Up Minority Access Internship Program, National Organization for Women Management Leaders of Tomorrow. Those are some other robust internship programs that can be feeders for organizations that are recruiting at a small or large scale. Yeah, thank you both for for sharing those with us, and and we will compile a list for the uh, members that are, are here today to share with our follow-up. Um, those are excellent resources. And you know, I know we're talking a lot about how we as HR leaders can kind of help drive, kind of like an economic stimulus, really hire these individuals, get a better understanding around these individuals. So let's take a second to really talk more about the class of 2020 and get a, a better grip on maybe their perspective entering the workforce. You know, the class of 2020 is Generation Z. And I know that for years, we, we all heard and we all remember the millennials, the conversation surrounding millennials and entering the workforce and some of the changes that occurred as a result of the way that the millennials, you know, wanted to see things done and how they would kind of align with an organization or an organization's values. So Michael and Seldrick, you both work very closely, you know, through your different channels and affiliations with 
you know, recent graduates. And my question for you is, you know, what, how can the class of 2020 themselves help to drive change for the better, both for, you know, employers and their professional networks? What advice are they being given? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. So I think there are a couple of things. And so we, we know that you know, the generation that is entering into the workforce is entering in, um, in, a, in a very interesting time. There are multi-generations in the workforce as well. One piece of advice that I would have for, for, for students is just making sure that we or they um, are students of current events. So having range, um, whether it be CNBC, whether it be the Hollywood Reporter, just making sure that they are aware of the things that are happening. I graduated undergrad in 2001. I was working in financial services in 2008. So very pivotal moments where there are a lot of things happening from the dot-com bubble bursting to the financial crisis. Um, and so I think the class of 2020 is going to be in an interesting place when the history books are told about it, where they have a lot of things that are coming to them or you know, around them, a lot of things are happening. But I also think um, you know, we as HR leaders we help them master the fundamentals. Um, some things just never change. You know, I, I talk a lot about my dad, you know, growing up him being a basketball coach and saying, learn the fundamentals as he was coaching teams. So, you know, we will slam dunk it. We will do flips in the air, but you have to learn how to dribble the ball. You have to learn how to pass the ball and shoot the ball and shoot and follow through. And I think making sure that we help the class of 2020 continue to learn the fundamentals um, and then they can build upon that. And I think we also need to help them find ways where we can decrease the technology gap. Um, there are ways where we can have them help other generations within the workforce learn things like how do you access Zoom? How do you um, make sure you're getting your messages across social media platforms like LinkedIn, so on and so forth. And then um, I know that the class of 2020 in this generation is really uh, vocal about corporate and social responsibility efforts, whether that be sustainability, whether that be things that are happening in the community. Um, so helping them have that platform and then fostering the innovation that comes with that platform, I think is, 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 is critical for them as well. That's great. That's great, Seldrick. And, and Michael, let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, just the state of the union with unemployment this high. There's naturally going to be some gaps in potentially graduates' resumes to getting their first job. What are, what are some advice that, you know, Temple University and yourself are giving these individuals to help fill those gaps and really kind of continue to uh, develop themselves, both professionally and personally? Sure. Um, some of the things that we're doing to kind of move the needle of, of people being unemployed. Oh. Sorry, Mike, Michael, you got muted. Yeah. Monthly basis call employer spotlight events. We used to host in-person events with employers. We would build up a strong street marketing campaign to invite people to come out to these meetings with employers that are hiring. The employer would then uh, discuss the company culture, what priority jobs they have available, and discuss in detail the application process because oftentimes it's the application process that can help a candidate stand out from the rest. And so they would go into those conversations. Now, because we're in this pandemic situation, we pivoted um, from the in-person employer spotlight events to virtual. And, and that's nothing new. We see a lot of organizations Michael, one second. There we go. But one of the things that we're doing now is putting heavier emphasis on that. So what we do now is we allow employers to do the same thing that they did in person, but now through virtual platforms like Zoom, WebEx, GoToMeeting, Google, um, what is it, Google Hangouts, and, and et cetera. Um, we're, we're seeing, because the class of 2020 Generation Z, is a highly digital um, a community of young leaders. Um, they, they know digital technology. They're very familiar with it, very comfortable with it. And so going to these virtual platforms is easy for them to segue to, to that kind of presentation and interaction with an employer. It's not as jolting um, as it is for those of us who are north of 50 years old. Um, so the younger generation, they're embracing this kind of uh, communication. Also with the younger generation, 
um, one of the things that we as older recruiters and older workforce professionals need to embrace with them uh, to create, once they're hired, to create a nurturing and welcoming environment is to allow the young people to reverse mentor us. Um, those of us that have a number of years under our belt, we can certainly impart in a traditional sense a mentor relationship with the emerging leaders that are coming on board. But we also have to allow the empowerment of the class of 2020 um, to come in to reverse mentor us because they're learning new technologies that maybe we haven't learned. They're learning new management practices that maybe we haven't seen. They're, they're being exposed to um, new technologies and new innovative ways of being efficient in the workplace that those of us who've been in the workplace for a long time may not be aware of. So they can empower us with information to really change cultural environment as it relates to social justice, as it relates to professionalism, as it relates to being productive. Um, so those are some things I think we need to take um, to heart as HR professionals as we move forward in our engagement with the um, Generation Z. And Generation Z needs to be mindful of the things that they're empowered with to reverse mentor us for the older, more experienced generation. Oh, I love that analogy. The reverse mentorship is uh, so important, Michael. And I know it's oftentimes what we're asking, you know, you know, flipping the switch and saying, what can you teach us in an interview? Um, but Michael, we did have some technical difficulties at the very beginning of your um, answer when you were talking about virtual spotlights. And I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss any context. Could you just maybe um, reiterate what you had mentioned about moving to virtual spotlights and what you may have mentioned before? Yes, yeah, so a virtual employer spotlight event is where we host an employer on a platform like Zoom, WebEx, et cetera, and we'll build up a street marketing campaign with community organizations that work with, um, whether it be recent college grads like Inroads, or we'll reach out to other organizations that work with um, adult uh, uh, um, job seekers, and we'll bring those job seekers together with these employers through these employer spotlight events. Employers will emphasize during these events, um, they're recruiting um, high priority job openings, their, their um, company culture, and great emphasis on their um, application process because, as I said earlier, the application process can help um, bolster a person's candidacy if they really know how to make themselves pop in, in terms of standing out from the rest of the crowd. So by employers imparting some real detailed information about their application process and what they're actually looking for. Candidates that are listening and, and a part of these virtual um, employer spotlights can be the better for it. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for taking us back on the spotlights. I think it's so important to be able to pivot um, both from the employer side, but also from the applicant side. You know, it's, it's the unfortunate nature of what we're dealing with right now, but there's still ways to feel personally connected and doing that virtually with you know, a camera on is uh, certainly a band-aid, but something we're getting more used to, I think, as days go by. So, Seldrick, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, obviously, NACE and you know, some of the things that NACE is doing to adapt, but also J.P. Morgan. Um, you know, if you could shed some light and maybe just continue to tell us a little bit about what both organizations are doing to kind of connect with um, candidates and uh, job seekers in a virtual landscape. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so NACE, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, um, um, do so many different things. Um, it's hard to concise, uh, get them all into one, one segment of the conversation, but you know, I definitely would encourage individuals to check out the NACE web, website because there are tons of articles, there are tons of um, research that's out there on the class of 2020 or prior classes and, and things that are future predictions of what we anticipate happening uh, with the, the labor market and the economy. I know NACE does a lot of work in helping define the different categories of job seekers. So there are companies that hire into internship programs or companies that hire into ready now talent. So have a role today, I need someone to fill that role. And then there has been this term um, been used for maybe a couple of years now, but the gig economy. So folks that are doing short-term assignments, and that might be something of big interest to HR leaders and for the class of 2020, where some of those two-year rotational programs may or may not um, be the same or how we 
operate in those environments may not be the same. So there may be short term assignments and it may not be um, as frowned upon as maybe it was five, 10, 20 years ago. Um, so NACE has done quite a bit of work and research in there. There's a couple of um, articles that I'll mention. One, exploring privilege and bias. Um, another, investing in technology to close the digital divide uh, that I found really uh, informative, similar to what Michael had mentioned around the reverse mentoring, so on and so forth. Um, I think, you know, at JP Morgan, many other organizations, we are trying to do um, what I, con what I consider not just recruiting, but um, I've, I've built my career on making sure that candidates are educated and made aware, have that exposure to the different opportunities. Um, so my apologies for all of my friends that work in academia, but a lot of times we see students that um, have a very linear thinking where they think this major is going to equate to a job that is synonymous with my major. And we don't necessarily uh, look at it that way. We're looking for folks that have transferable skills that can, we know that they have the ability to learn. And so it's our job and other HR leaders job to make sure that we're having those conversations and we're breaking down some of those uh, myths around your major. Now, if you are going to operate on my, my heart or my lungs, I need you to have an advanced medical degree. Um, outside of that, there are a lot of things that are transferable. And so um, what I know a lot of organizations, including the organization I work for, are doing is making sure we're providing that space to have those conversations to say, hey, we want you to be um, passionate about the industry or passionate about the type of work. And we can teach you what you need to know. Um, and I think that hopefully will be a, a continuously will be an eye opener um because unless you grew up in a household that did that type of work you may just not even uh, know and so what i always try to make sure that i explain the leaders in our organization and externally is that people don't apply for things that they don't know exist um so we have to make sure that we are providing that awareness that exposure especially with communities that have been either underserved or just haven't been exposed to that, um, it's even more critical to get and attract those individuals into your, your companies and organizations. That's, that's great. Michael, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I wanted to inject, um, we may even have to rethink as employers um, how we go about our recruiting, our recruiting of our future talent pool. We have major companies like Google, Apple, Costco, Whole Foods, Hilton, and Starbucks, where these major mega companies are now dismissing their college degree requirements, where mm -hmm. now they're hiring people based on the skills and the temperament that they bring to the table. Um, we typically refer um, to some of these skills as emotional intelligence, um, as uh, soft skills, but when we look at what these major companies are putting emphasis on, I hate to use that term, soft skills. Um, these, these skills are, are, are real hard skills, in my, in my opinion. And if you can rethink and maybe shift the paradigm from just thinking college grads can only fit into this compartment of job openings that I have, you, you're actually broadening your talent pool because if people are bringing the bells and whistles that you're looking for in, in a huge way, but maybe they don't have the college degree, maybe me, we as employers might want to rethink how we expand our talent pool. Just a thought. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thought, uh, Michael, because you know we, we talk a lot with HR leaders and, and recruiters and also hiring managers and frontline managers. And, I think that as we consider doing that, it, be, it makes us, it necessitates becoming better interviewers, right? And as HR leaders, it's the, the hurdle that we're all trying to jump to work with our different hiring departments and managers and different portions of the business to become better interviewers. You know, oftentimes, I think, what do they say? A recruiter may spend only a couple seconds on a resume, but mm -hmm. obviously our interviews are much longer and there's a reason for that. You know, looking past the degree and getting to some of those soft skills is important. And I think we as recruiters and Power as skills. HR leaders. Power skills. 
Yes, exactly. It, it's something we do naturally, but making sure that that's happening consistently across companies. Obviously, you've listed a few that are, uh, they've got it down. Well, that takes us really to our next topic. And, you know, I, I will say before we move on that um, CSS is our, our marketing department does great research and surveying uh, to various, you know, companies and companies we work for and leaders across the industry. And we are in the midst of putting out a blog that's really about this topic. So I'm really excited. It's, it's, it's hot for us. And we're finding that a lot of people are kind of in the position today to say, what does this mean? You know, do we really need that degree? Do we really need someone that majored in this? And how do we kind of peel back the layers to find the person that's really going to be driving the change and making an impact for the company? So, you know, it, it, it brings up the conversation. Should employers hire for, you know, maybe a higher skill set, maybe turn two jobs into one and offer more pay, which, which drives the conversation around pay, right? We oftentimes have graduates, I know on myself I have, where they have a number in their head. When they're sitting with us in an interview, they, this is what I should be offered. So I'm curious, you know, what other companies are doing to, and what they're prioritizing in terms of qualities and, you know, skills and experience as, you know, they're interviewing. And I know we're gonna have a survey. Um, and as we, if we roll out that survey, Michael, I'd love to talk to you about money. It's important. And what are you hearing and seeing from college graduates in regards to their expectations on earnings compared to what actually is being offered and is happening? I, I think, especially with this current generation of Z, you know, they wanna make the big bucks now. And I think that's, you know, an idea where they need to pump the brakes. <laughs> um, they're a little eager to wanna to just move from point A to jump automatically to the end of the alphabet to make the big dollars. But the reality is um, companies now, because of this pandemic, because the economy literally had to shut down for a couple of months, um, we're gonna find that companies may not pay uh, the type of money that they used to because they've lost so much um, of, their, of their profit margins uh, during this, this shutdown. And so um, this, this Generation Z has to be braced with the reality that, um, the, the, let's say, for instance, the uh, U.S. Department of Labor, uh, the average American salary was $56,000 a year. Now, because of the pandemic, we may see that that average salary going down a bit. So the expectation for Generation Z, the class of 2020, has to be more realistic and that maybe that job that once paid maybe, you know, $56,000, $70,000 is now only paying $50,000 or maybe $60,000. Um, so I have to face that reality and understand that it's just going to be the nature of the economy. Now, one of the ways that um, a, a, a HR person, you know, can, you know, help with this issue is when they're making the campus visits, when they're doing uh, presentations with the young people is to make this conversation, um, you know, real for them to let them know that these are the constraints and the um, pains that corporations are now going through, where the financial purses that once existed may not be there, and it may recover down the road for early 2021. But for now, coming in, let let's emphasize as um, employers, some of the other things like benefits, uh, the perks that we can offer. Maybe it's the childcare that might hook a person in. Maybe it's the tuition reimbursement. Um, maybe it's, you know, um, it, 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 more vacation time. We have to be innovative about how maybe we can hook um, this new class of recruits in and not just look at the money thing because maybe there's some other things we can do on our side of the fence as employers to incentivize and attract these young people. That's great. And, and Seldrick, as, as you may have seen, our, our polls show that for most employers, what's most important to them is the cultural match. So Michael, you know, shedding great insight into how can we leverage different aspects when maybe the salary isn't going to be as available to us in the pandemic. You know, Seldrick, this, this question for you is going to be more around what advice can we give companies to really narrow down and figure out that they're finding the right cultural match, but also in the virtual landscape, how do we promote 
you know, our company cultures to make sure that we're putting everything out there to attract the right talent as well. Yeah, I think, I think part of the answer is spending time with the candidates as, the, as they are going through the process and then really spending some time thinking through what are we really looking for um, and taking the time to assess if we're looking for a, a cultural match, what does that mean? And then also making sure that that is free from whatever biases may um, surface as we are discovering what does cultural fit mean. And then also making sure that it is, um, you know, if there are competencies that we're looking for or other things as well, you know, to the point that Michael made about compensation, a lot of their, their large companies um, pay the same thing for the class that's entering in. Um, and so it's up to the individuals once they join the organization to prove themselves and their incentive compensation will um, be a direct reflection of uh, their ability to produce once they're on the job. And there are other things that um, companies can take a look at that might be attractive uh, for folks. So do you have um, free food? Um, do you have, if not free food, do you have a cafeteria in the office? If we're not in the office, is to maybe other things, but I know some companies that are very um, future thinking, um, I wouldn't say future thinking, but just may have the culture around it, um, especially in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of companies where you can bring your pet to work, um, uh, or do you have outdoor space? If we're in a virtual environment, it may not be the physical space, but it may be things like, you know, tuition reimbursement or medical cost or um, flexibility with where you work and, your vacation time or your vacation bank. But I, I think if we're assessing cultural fit, we have to understand what is that culture that we want to achieve? Um, do we as an organization already have that culture that we're trying to achieve? Or are there people, behaviors, things that we do that are getting in the way of that? And are there cultural barriers um, that already exists because we can say a lot of great and slick things to recruit people into the organization, but then are we putting our arms around the hires when they start to make sure that they can truly be a, um, they can truly feel included into the organization. So I think it's um, starting from, you know, the end of saying, all right, who are we currently? Who do we want to be? And do we have the right people that can help foster that, that culture? And then how do, we identify, how do we identify people that, um, that are going to um, fit nicely into the organization or the organization we're trying to um, create in the future? Can I say something, Evan? Please, Bob, real, real quick. Um, Seldrick made me think of something as he was talking. We spend an, an enormous amount of resources and, and man hours in strategizing how we're going to recruit candidates, whether it's candidates at large, whether it's diversity candidates, whether it's a combination of the two. We spend a lot of time on that. But I think we, we need to spend just as much time and man hours and resources in the onboarding process mm -hmm. so that we can bring them into a culture and make sure that the culture of the organization is welcoming and make sure that the culture of the organization does respect diversity and gender and you know other things. I, I think we need to really start shifting that same energy and level of resources in the onboarding process as we do because for the most part, what tradition has shown us is that we'll do the great job of recruiting them and giving them the great dog and pony show of our organization. But then once they're in, we're like, okay, be successful. And, and there's no type of, you know, strategy, real in-depth strategy to really get them acculturated to that organization. Yeah, excellent point, guys. And, you know, I, I was uh, reading something the other day by Tony Robbins, and he talked about how relationships last, both personal and professional, when you treat the person the way you did the first time you met with them and engaged in a relationship, it could be a first date, it could be the onboarding process through the duration. And I think that that really does remain true in the professional landscape. We work very hard to attract talent and we work extremely hard to get them to, like Seldrick said, we say slick things to sound cool. A lot of companies are doing that, but what are we doing when they're here and how do we engage with them? 
And we all know every company does the exit interview. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, what are we doing in between? So you guys bring up some really great points there and the importance of that. And I know Carl had mentioned, and I appreciate Carl pointing this out, but cultural fit means different things to every organization. And it's really getting to understand what is the culture. And I think it's very important to recognize that every single employee contributes to the culture and every single employee also has a desire for what the culture is. So uh, really great topics, Seldrick and, uh, and, and Michael, thank you for, for bringing us through that. So, you know, I want to um, move into kind of how will the class of 2020 be defined? right, moving forward. We, we, we have a lot of, you know, we try not to put labels and definitions, but we, we really do need to look at from the lens that they're looking at things. You know, there's a lot of leadership uh, lessons that can be learned just by observing, like Seldrick said earlier, some of the current events and things that are happening around us. So I'm interested to hear, and, and Seldrick, I'll lean on you first, if, if that's okay, um, sure. just about how the class of 2020 will be defined and how we can better understand them as we engage with them from the get-go and hopefully retain them through the duration of uh, you know, a business, business partnership. Yeah, I think, I think some of that is still being defined and I think um, it'd be interesting to watch and see how everything plays out. I do think the class of 2020 um, may have a bit of um, resentment is a strong word, but I think there may be a sense of loss um, because there may not have been, um, and I think we're going to see it in two waves. So I think we're going to see the class of 2020, the, the college folks that are graduating. We're also going to see the high school class of 2020, and that's going to show up in a variety, variety of ways four years from now. So that's something we also have to watch. Um, but I think for the college class of 2020, I think there's going to be a sense of loss and belonging, a need to connect with people. Um, I think we're also going to see them be very resilient and innovative and think through. We all have had to, um, reframe how we do daily things very, very quickly. Um, so, but I also think, you know, back in 2008, so the class of 2008, they were going through the financial crisis. There may have been opportunities that normally would have been afforded to them, but mom, dad may have lost their job through the financial crisis. And it was very targeted within Wall Street firms and financial services. And there was the whole Occupy Wall Street movement and, you know, conversations around the bailout. And so for the class of 2020, it's not really industry specific. Um, so there's not necessarily something or an industry or a company to, to target. So I'd be really curious to see how they approach um, job opportunities. It might be, you know, I, I was listening to NPR this morning and there was a mention of um, opportunities in healthcare and medical devices and and other things. And so we've heard a lot of conversations about how the environment is so clean now because pollution levels have gone down. And so I know sustainability is a really big deal for a lot of folks that are in college or in high school. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see. I think as HR leaders, um, we're going to have to think innovatively and think through how we support that inclusivity and that sense of belonging. But I also think with the, a lot of the events that are happening from a social standpoint with um, what we're hearing with demonstrations in different cities, George Floyd, so on and so forth, the, the cat is out of the bag. There is no longer a tiptoeing around conversations. So I think the class of 2020 will be demanding, even if it, and demanding, I don't want it to sound like a forceful way, but I think the expectation is that if you are not having a conversation with me, about what is happening in the current environment with how people are treated in this country, then you're irrelevant. And I think that's gonna be a really big deal and an expectation for this class. Hey guys, really quickly, sorry, I don't wanna get off topic, but I just wanna jump in because there is some activity from the chat box. Um, so Seldrick and Michael, this is probably a question for you guys. Um, someone asked, what advice do you have for employees who want to try and vet the true culture of a company what questions can they ask and what can they look for? I think one of the easiest ways to kind of evaluate culture is from an inside uh, perspective through internships or through externships or through some type of, um, you know, experiential uh, uh, learning uh, opportunity for, you know, a person to really get the upfront feel. Um, if you're graduating nowadays, with just high academics, with 
no type of work experience under your belt, you're really behind the eight ball. And I don't care if you're graduating, you know, from, you know, an A-list Ivy League school. If you don't have some type of work experience under your belt, uh, whether that's acquiring a temp assignment through staffing agencies or, or again, internships and externships, et cetera, you're, you're really not um, fully getting the, the, the depth out of your college education as a candidate uh, that's going to compete for these competitive jobs out here. So I think one of the best ways is for you know companies to build robust internship programs or externship programs, or even opportunities for you know inf informational interview sessions, or even retreats, um, host retreats of preferred candidates that you're considering, either a day retreat or a weekend retreat to personally observe the, the candidates, and the candidates can observe the company um, and its culture. But I think those are the things that can really help one figure out, is this culture something that I can fit into? Yeah, I think really quickly, I'll just add a couple of things or just questions that one might be able to ask. So if I am the employee or if I'm the candidate and I'm, I'm meeting with someone and I want to understand someone's company culture, then I might ask questions like, what do you do in your weekends? Um, um, are you active in your company's business resource groups or employee groups? Um, do you all have outlets for your companies to connect socially like a running club or uh, those types of activities or you know what's important to you um, personally and how do you balance that with your organization and so that will tell me a lot depending upon how they answer those questions if they say hey I work all weekend and um, you know that's just the, the expectation and that tells me a lot if they tell me yeah I'm active in our um, women's network even though I'm a, a guy but I want to learn more about um, some of my colleagues um, experiences through the company then that, that kind of hints at their uh, inclusivity within the organization um, so just just things that, things of that nature yeah those, those are great points and and as you guys both mentioned you know the the getting your feet wet to get a real experience whether it's through an internship or an externship or you know uh, for instance our company as a uh, as a contractor or temporary to hire you know, we, for what we do as a business, we measure those things quite often, you know, uh, time to fill, um, you know, percentage of fill, but assignment completion is a very important metric for our industry. And I will say that it's the companies that approach the partnership with a contractor and just speaking off experience that say, hey, this is as much a trial for you guys as the contractors to try us as it is for us to try you. And it's that mentality and that approach and that proof in the pudding that leads to the better ratios of successful assignment completion and conversion. So, you know, the proof is really in the pudding with those types of opportunities, allowing for candidates and job seekers to really get in, you know, certainly entry level, it's a little bit different and a little bit easier to get in and try a company's culture. And then it also holds the company accountable to Stephanie's point on really walking the talk and not just having to say it in a, you know, two hour interview or an hour long interview. So um, really great points, guys. And I, I can't thank you enough. I'm, I, I do want to turn it back over to Kara. But before we do, Seldrick and Michael, you guys have been absolutely fantastic to partner with and provided some really great content for us today. Uh, I welcome everyone to please connect with Seldrick and Michael on LinkedIn. Um, just from your post, it's very insightful. And, you know, we will share with everyone a recording of this. So there are some individuals that were unable to make it. We will also share the resources uh, from internship programs and different resources available out there with our follow-up and uh, certainly, you know, the website for, for NACE as well. So Seldrick and Michael, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Evan. And I agree, Seldrick and Mike and Evan, you guys, you know, I know I speak for everyone when I say that you guys had some fantastic points. And I think a lot of your messages were really powerful and thank you to the audience and all of you who are who participated um, and we do have a, a little special message for you all at the end um, coach doug peterson will kick it off so let's take a look hi coach peterson here and I wanted to join Contemporary Staffing Solutions in celebrating all of you. 
And last year, I helped Contemporary Staffing Solutions celebrate their late founder, Donna Pearson, and their 25th anniversary by fundraising for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. We were thrilled to see almost $40,000 donated on behalf of an amazing lady who started her own business at the age of 43 and grew it to almost 20 million in nearly six years. This story has certainly shaped and continues to inspire the leadership team at CSS. And we hope that they really inspire you. Stay tuned as they offer their own words of wisdom as you celebrate being a part of class of 2020. And so your new journey begins. CSS wants to congratulate you on this amazing stepping stone in your life. Although I'm sure it's not exactly how you had always pictured it. And we all feel for the 2020 grads and what they're going through during this time. Try not to let it snuff your spirits. Uh, we need more positivity in this world now more than ever. Push through these tough times and challenging times because you'll learn from this. And I want you to really focus on the future because all of your futures are extremely bright right now. Remember, as uncertain and unreal as these tough times may appear, we will get through this. In a challenging situation comes opportunity. The opportunity to make a difference. Life will consistently provide you with roadblocks and force you to veer off course. But in the end, you'll make it to your destination. Be grateful for what you have. Reflect on what led you to succeed. Reflect on the times where you wanted to give up and what stopped you. Reflect on the hard work that it took to get here. Take pride in all of your accomplishments and know that this is just the beginning. Make sure know, you know how you're motivated, how you're challenged, and how you lead. Be the most positive person you can be. Because as you embark on your journey, you're going to face many more challenges and adversity. These twists and turns will happen frequently and regularly, but if you can prepare yourself ahead of time, that you expect to change course and make the necessary adjustments, then you have already fought half the battle. You're going to make mistakes in life, and when you do, make sure you own those mistakes. And successful people also learn to forgive themselves for mistakes. As you look at your future plans, there are many decisions that have to be made, and it can be overwhelming. What, attend, what university to attend, what to major in, what you want to do after you graduate, and many other unknowns. You've got a big transition in front of you. So as you move forward, I want you to think of your values. And the biggest value I think which is most important is to have your integrity. Without your integrity, you really don't have anything. Be accountable. You can either hold yourself accountable in life or you can point the finger and blame others. For every time you point the finger at someone, you have three pointing back at you. Ask yourself, will this really matter in five years? Make a payment to savings with every paycheck and live within your means. Um, protect your credit so that you can continue to get funding for whatever you're trying to do down the road. Practice random acts of kindness so we can make the world a better place and pay it forward to the generations that are behind you, who will show up one day and humble your butts, just like all of you did to us. In order to excel and in order to succeed, you have to leave your comfort zone. You have to be do willing to do what others may not. And you have to recognize that there will always be an opportunity to find humor in any situation. Don't stop trying to move the needle forward. Keep working hard, keep trying to find solutions. There's a new collar worker. Everybody talks about the white collar, the blue collar, but guess what? In today's world, we're calling you the new collar. What are you gonna do? You're gonna define the, the times that you're gonna work. You're gonna define the locations where you're gonna work. You're gonna define whether an education is even needed to do what you're trying to accomplish. Work hard in everything that you do. When you get into your career in the workforce, try to make yourself irreplaceable at the company you're working for. Go above and beyond as much as you can. I believe in hard work and it takes a lot in order to succeed. The work that you work ethic you put into school and your job will also allow you to enjoy your passions outside of work. As you embark on your next journey, make sure that you find your voice and you tap your passion of what you do every single day. Believe in yourself, your confidence will grow. This is just the beginning of a very, very bright future for you. The new collar worker will create multiple startup businesses solving real problems that real families are having and real communities are challenged with and businesses. The evolution, 
that's about to happen is exciting. Stay positive and power through into a bright new future of endless opportunity. You are history in the making class of 2020, and we are all so proud of you. Congratulations. Let's do this. Woo! We just heard some great stories and tips from the leaders at CSS. Congratulations to the class of 2020 and go birds. Awesome. Wow. What a, that was an amazing video from our CSS leaders. Um, so that's all we have for today, everybody. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it and uh, take care.